welcome to part two of the Foyt's Tusker technical series. In this part we'll be taking a quick look at steering, then moving on to look at the brakes, clutch and gearbox. Hope you find it useful. Brakes. The handbrake and footbrake operate on the same shoes and are interlinked. If you lose one, you could easily lose both. The cables are, I believe, no longer available from Thwaites, but there are cable specialists online. If you send them your old broken one, they'll send you a new one. If you end up making new brake pull rods, these items down here are frequently seized. You'll probably find out the hard way that the brake manufacturer used UNF threads, whereas on the opposite end of this rod, the machine manufacturer used BSF. So you've got two very, very similar thread systems which are visually identical but don't actually fit. There may have been some swearing. These little dirt excluding gaiters here are the proper ones are no longer obtainable, but an acceptable dodge is to use the Gator, as on my parts list, the Land Rover Series 3. It's 1970, something, 1969 to 85, something like that. Transmission brake Gator, and these work acceptably well. They're not quite the same as the originals. Same boots as used on the clutch, which is a brake drum. More on that later. I've not said much about the brakes, other than the control rods. Everything that goes on inside the brakes, as far as I'm aware, the parts are no longer no longer obtainable. I was lucky with mine. I didn't need any parts apart from getting the shoes relined, which I had done with a local brake relining firm. I do have another video on YouTube, however, about repairing Girling and Lockheed brake expanders, if you're, sorry, brake adjusters. If your adjusters are knackered, this video represents a potential way out. I've also previously done things like machine these from solid, but, you know, I'd much rather buy them if I could. Steering. These Marl's steering boxes are often the death of old two-wheel drive dumpers, because the cost of repairing them is astronomic. Ignore this bit of pipe here. These boxes are filled with oil to the level of the filler plug that's there. These boxes were typically used on like commercial vehicles and things of the time where they were inclined at much greater angle. Therefore, this top bearing in here, there's a bearing on the top and a bearing on the bottom, would have been more kind of immersed in the oil and as you steer, the oil will get dragged around. However, in this very upright sit of a bag position, in these dumpers, the top bearing really doesn't get that much oil. So if it doesn't fail through wearing out purely because it's not getting any oil and it's wearing, it'll fail because of rust corrosion that's forming in here and running down and it rusts away. There's a big gubbins in here, you don't need to know what's in there, but the scroll kind of falls apart, loses engagement, then it self-destructs. So what I've done is extend this upwards to bring the oil level up nice and high, you can see I've still got a little weeping going on. So my top bearing is always covered in oil. As well as the top bearing failing, the bottom bearing can fail because the water's got in. There's a little plate here, you can undo these bolts, check there's no water in them. There are some shims and stuff in here, so you need to be careful when you undo it to make sure you don't lose the shims. Water typically gets in around the top particularly if people have fitted like a car steering wheel that's not quite the right one. Whilst we're at the top you'll see there's a little gubbins on there that's not standard. This is something I've fitted. The Thwaites dumper, digger dumper instructions mention that you can move the machine around using the arm. You'll see that in some of my other videos. However, when you try and do that, the rear wheels will normally go onto full lock and then you can't move in the direction you want to. So I've fitted this little device here. So turn the wheel, you see that little spot of daylight appearing there. I insert that pin, 
which locks the steering, which means I can easily move the machine around using the arm. This is a real boon. Um, I've machined this component, but I'm sure there are simpler ways of doing it. And it really makes a massive difference when you're using the digger. Gearbox. This is the Tusker gearbox also used on other Thwaites models and I think some other equipment like pile driving rigs and stuff. This very long spindly shaft that you'd imagine would break but doesn't is the input shaft. It's a spare one I've got in the shed and there's the output shaft. The box is split along its centre line so that when you undo a load of bolts it actually lifts off the top. I mentioned that there's two different types of oil specification in there and I kind of struggle to understand why. Newage won't recognise this box now. If you quote them the serial number of your box they'll tell you it's not one of theirs and when you say it's got their name on it they'll say oh well, is it a very old gearbox and they don't support it. Thwaites, however, do hold lots of stock of these gearbox parts and certainly all the common items Thwaites did have when I rebuilt my machine, that was about six years ago, I don't know if they've still got them. But anyway, you'll see on here that the recommended lubricant is Shell Rotella SX Oil 30. That is a diesel engine oil, not a gear oil. Later versions of this newish box, including the one in my Tusker, recommend an EP90. Now, if you look at viscosity grading systems, SAE30, that's an engine oil grade viscosity system, equates in viscosity to a gear oil 90, approximately. So that in itself might kind of explain part of it, but the 90 is still a bit thicker and it's got the extreme pressure additive in, whereas this doesn't. If you pull these apart, this is an earlier version of the box, you will find that there's a big and normal ball bearing race in each end that aren't especially special and still easily obtainable. But inside the box there are some gears which kind of float. On the earlier boxes they float on plain bushes. On the later boxes they float, no they don't float, they run on needle rollers. And that is the difference. That is why the earlier ones use an engine oil rating. They're the ones that use plain bushes, like you know, like big end bearings in your car engine. And the later ones were these needle rollers. These needle rollers are really, really small in diameter, almost like little knife edges. And they're the ones that specify the EP oil to um, to withstand that extreme force of these tiny little steel pins running against the, the shafts. Like many boxes of this age, it filled with water. And there's something about hardening to steel that means that when you get water on it, it corrodes faster than you would believe, and that's what happened to my box. And where the needle rollers had sat, stationary, the machine had been stood for a while, they'd actually corroded little kind of like scoring lines on these main shafts, which I think, I didn't even ask them, I and they're just going to be expensive, aren't they? Um, so I put the shafts up in the lathe, I mean there's no way they'd have run as they were on new needle rollers. I put the shafts in the lathe and I polished the corrosion out and thought, oh this is good. But by the time I'd done that the shafts were five thou down on diameter and five thou for a needle roller is, you know, quite a lot of jingling around and that's a recipe for it to die pretty quickly. And it was about that time that I started wondering why the two oil specs. So this is a spare box I had and I pulled this apart and to my surprise it didn't have needle rollers, it had plain bushes. So to get round the problem, I mean when I can't make needle roller bearings, I mean that's quite specialist, um, but it is easy to turn a bronze bush on a lathe, or relatively easy, and make allowances on its size for the fact that you've polished five thou off the shafts. So what I did was convert, retro convert my gearbox to the earlier state. So I threw the needle rollers in the bin and with my polished shafts I machined bronze bushes as substitutes and 
altered the size of them to accommodate that the shafts were now under size. Um, I'm now running my box on engine oil because it no longer has needle roller bearings, it just has the normal ball bearings in the end and plain bronze bushes on the middle. I'm running engine oil in it, this, this straight 30 grade instead of EP90 which smells of cat sweet and is horrible. Um, and that was six years ago and it's it's done many miles up and down the road and it's all still fine. Rubber boots by the way, Thwaites still have them. Um, another thing I did was the, the lever was really awful and sloppy and everything. Um, can't get the levers anymore, can't get this housing anymore, that was worn as well so I sort of turned a new lever up and there's a ball on the end and made it all good with the lathe and, and now it's like really precise. So that's the gearbox. I think I talked about the sprockets earlier, this is the sprocket that fits on the back of the clutch. So the number of teeth is entirely standard, it's a standard chain pitch, it's three quarter inch pitch. Um, sprockets are available in steps of like how many teeth you want you know and this is a normal number but what's not normal is this profile you've got like a little step on one side but a recess on the other so all I did was to order a standard plate sprocket I can't quite remember what I did to it but there was some welding and machining involved and bits got chopped off one side and added to the other um, and they've lasted really well and you can see the, the teeth on this sprocket they're really hooked and this used to make a terrible noise when you were driving it. It was like sounded like going over a cattle grid. The engine sprocket's much the same. There's a standard number of teeth, but the the, the boss where it mounts is is different, um, and and consequently I modified them to fit. And a quick look at the clutch. This is um, a knackered spare that I've got. A lot of people will tell you these are terrible things and they rip the linings out, la di da di da. I've just adjusted my clutch for the first time in six years and it wasn't actually slipping then. I just adjusted it because I thought it needed it. It did go up a bit. I think people just let them go until they slip really badly and are then surprised that the linings don't work very well after they've been horribly overheated. Anyway. Is this bit on the end, which the Thwaites engineers tell me they used to call the Mickey Mouse. There's a little thrust bearing on there that I think you can replace. Mm, it's not sure. This spring no longer no longer available from Thwaites, um, but there's loads of spring suppliers online, and if ever I broke one, I wouldn't put this one back on. I'd measure what this one is. Um, and, and get a copy made or hopefully get a stock item that will be good enough. But anyway, let's put the spring out of the way. So the clutch, as it is, because it's a mystery to lots of people, normally that spring's compressed. This peg here is a little guide to stop Mickey Mouse spinning around. And on the end of this snapped off bolt here, this would normally be a rod that comes up to there. So the the action of this spring being compressed is pulling on that rod much the same way that when you pull on the, the brake rod on the brakes it applies the brake and this is exactly the same because when you pull on the rod it applies these shoes, pulls them outwards. Not quite sure where you'd get new gubbins for that from, I think I'd end up making or modifying. But this adjuster pretty certain it's a kind of classic car item. Uh, you can see the head, adjust, the adjusting head on mine snapped off. Um, pretty certain if you look at kind of 70s cars like Triumph Dolomite or maybe Austins and stuff might use something like that. You might have to get somebody to match up. Be aware there's some horribly cheap reproduction items out there that won't last five minutes in this application. But here's the clutch drum. These are the countersink bolts hold the drum to the drive sprocket. So that kind of goes on there. The chain drive is permanently driving the drum which is free to free wheel should you release the clutch. When I took my clutch apart these little countersunk screws were all loose and the heads were deformed. 
If ever you get this far and you replace these screws, which you'd only ever do if you're replacing the sprocket or, or if they've come loose, you need a fine threaded screw and you need one that fits nicely. You can't be sticking an M10 course in there. The course thread won't do up tight enough. It'll all come loose. You need something fine thread. Um, these screws, I can tell you, are British standard fine. Um, very few people supply them now. And it'd be much better to get an Allen screw and you really wang it up tight. Um, but at some point, the screws on my digger were changed to Unified National Fine, UNF. Now, British Standard bolts, so that's BSW, BS, BS Whitworth, you know, uh, British Standard Fine. Um, and in fact, metric, the countersink angle is 90 degrees. On Unified, it's 82 degrees. Who thought of that? So consequently, if you fit a unified bolt in a, in a hole that's been countersunk for a BS bolt, or vice versa, they won't do it properly, probably deform, possibly break, won't end well, and this is not an easy thing to kind of get apart. If you do replace these bolts, just be conscious and ask yourself what, what countersinks are in there now versus what bolts are you putting in. When you when you take this apart, it, it's the same as lots of things. This is a big spring under pressure, so if you just undo the nut on the end, it is going to fly off and smash all your teeth out. I think I ended up wedging some bits of wood in the back of the machine to compress the spring, and then undid it all. It's a Thwaites special tool, which is a, a spanner with a square end on the end of it for adjusting these, um, and it's a nice bit of kit to have. I've got one from the factory; somebody gave it to me, uh, but. Without it, I guess you just have to, I don't know, dick around with a socket or something. These are, uh, again, the, the Land Rover, the Land Rover rubber boots fit this. Just looking back at this gearbox again, and this is the, the drive flange to which the, the prop shaft would, would bolt. A nice new seal in this gearbox here, which I reconditioned. There's the surface on which the seal runs. You can see on my end of my thumbnail there, there's a big groove worn in it because it's got grit and crap in there. If I was to run this gearbox with this drive flange, um, it'd chew the seal up really quick. Anyway, cut short, there's such a thing as a shaft repair kit. They're about 15 quid each, which seems like they like robbery, but the hassle it saves you. So basically it's a really thin sleeve, kind of made of ground, highly polished stainless steel. There's a little top hat rim on there and you, you tap it on um, using the rim. Once it's on, the top hat pulls off on a pre-indented kind of indented line, exactly like the, the ring pull on a can of Coke. So you, you tap it on with a little device they give you and then you tear off the rim and it presents you with an entirely new sealing surface. These shaft sleeves are really thin, they're like, I don't know, less than half a mil thick. So it won't affect your choice of seal uh, and it means you can reuse this if you couldn't get hold of one and I'm sure these will cost more than £15 to buy so uh, yeah your bearing stockist anyone who sells bearings will be able to sell you a shaft repair kit I think that's probably enough for part two hope you found it clear and useful in part three we'll be looking at the arm and hydraulic system